some good stories and there are some dandies around here <coughs> right Bill <laughs> right Ed <laughs> so uh, and, and we'll we'll kick some of these stories around okay Dennis you want to take off with Bill <laughs> I'll try this, this is that's old folks this tiny print is like reading a warranty label but I will give it a shot the road ran north through the town. One side street headed west from it for about a city block up to the gate of the mill. A hundred yards farther was the river, which brought the logs to the mill. Thirty or so houses lined the road, and on one side of the street, a railroad spur ran diagonally, crossing the road at the north end of town. There were a, house, a few houses still beyond the crossing, but that was the end of town. The spur went over the river on a trestle on the, at the other end, other end south of the houses. There was a small baseball diamond with covered bleachers, then a stand of trees and a large empty lawn beyond the schoolyard. Further south were the two churches. Then the road joined the main east-west highway and the town ended again. Everything was made of wood except the Catholic Church, which appeared to be of stone. The houses were single-storied with porches except for a couple of larger ones on the side street near the mill. They were all painted with the same white and gray paint. The wooden plank sidewalks, which ran alongside the road on both sides where there were houses, ended at the railroad crossing and at the baseball field and on the side street, the walk ended at the gate to the mill. All along the western side of the road opposite the churches and the school, opposite the park and the baseball field, up almost to the side street ran the tall wooden picket fence of the mill. There was no sidewalks or path on that side of the road. At intervals, inside the fence were tall light poles for the mill yard at night and there were fire stations all at intervals also. These were sheds with barrels of sand alongside a cone-shaped fire buckets hanging on from hooks under the eaves. Beside the mill with the great gray wooden saw house and the giant wooden sheds and, and the endless stacks of graying stickered lumber drying it seemed forever. There were three big wooden buildings in the town. The office and the hotel stood in great lawns facing the houses on the side street. The office looked like a big single-storied white house with a porch and green shuttered windows. Across the lawn, birch trees stood at the hotel, three stories high with a long veranda on two sides. The projecting turrets with covered, curved windows and scroll work, gingerbread in the corners and eaves further south. The school was a tall shingled rectangle of two high gray stories with a cupola. The black top play yard isolated it from the churches and his basement was only half underground so that the building seemed even taller on either side. East and west of town the mountains lifted up steeply, heavily wooded. At night the sparks from the teepee burner swirled upward into the milky sky. I had bought some dirty books into my grandmother's house, <laughs> our house. Directly opposite the office was the manager's house. My grandfather was the manager of the mill. He had an office in the office. 
and a room in the hotel. On Fridays, I would take a plate over to the hotel and go around to the back to get some black cod cooked by Bob Chef's stepfather. I would bring it home and eat it in the breakfast nook with a baked potato cooked by my grandmother, skinned and mashed flat with butter on it. The way my grandfather liked it, I would have waxed beans with this. On this occasion, I had stopped to talk with Bob Shep, who was several years older than I, who had a different class of comic books. <laughs> Mine were animal books, which meant that they concerned the adventures of animals who talked and carried on rather like human beings without sexual desire. Bob Sheff's comic book concerned soldiers in Korea who had also been in World War II, and some of them concerned wax, who seemed to be women soldiers. Others concerned high school students. The girls greatly resembled the wax except for their clothing. This evening, Bob Sheff had traded me several Donald Ducks for a couple of military dramas in which a whack had suffered mysterious embarrassment in the company of a handsome officer. Actually, I don't know what the story was because my grandmother noticed it poking out of my shirt. Oh, Billy, she said. It was among the great incidents of my life. I gave her the khaki-colored comics and retired and shamed in my room. I believe nothing further was ever said about this. That is how we handle such things. Disappointment and express, expressed guilt was introduced and accepted. Nothing further was said. Did my dear, sweet, wonderful grandmother wonder, as I did, exactly what happened? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my recollections of Bill, I, I imagine Ed and Ike, probably different. One of my recollections is that great old house they had right across from the office and a Schwinn bicycle on the front porch and that Schwinn bicycle was polished. The chrome shined on it. It had a tank that filled in between the seat and the handlebars. It had a horn button in there. It was class. And the, the grounds down around that house was spectacular. That's my recollections of Bill other than a vivid imagination, as kids we would play games out in the hotel lots that would be totally bizarre. I mean, you could use them today as scripting for some of these video games that the kids play, but it was just our imagination as our imaginations rolled along. Uh, eventually, I'll tell some stories about Paul Bunyan and uh, one of our friends who had an imagination just as vivid and I'll put my jelly bean hat on when I tell that one. But anyway, <laughs> next I think we need to, to hear from Rick on Wally Otterson. Where'd you want me to go? Uh, Take my chair, Rick. This is Memories of Bonner People. My name is Wally Otterson, and I live in Bonner, lived in Bonner for a few days. That didn't sound right. I lived in Bonner from a few days after my birth in Missoula in 1928 until the middle of 1950. I lived with my parents in house built by the company for my grandfather around 1900. That house was the fourth house upriver from the roundhouse on the same side of the street. During my life in Bonner, I did nothing that would make people remember me. In fact, if one more boy had been born of my age, I wouldn't have made our little league team called the Bonner Roundhouse. Our neighbors were Danny Pleasant, George LaForge, Frank Farmer, John Magnuson, Carl Jacobson, and others. They all had kids that I grew up with named Lefty Pleasant, Donna LaForge, Howard Johnson, and the Jacobson boys, who were a bit older. Bonner was a great place to grow up, as well as a wonderful group of people. We all received a first-class education at the Bonner School 
and learned how to respect and help your neighbors when they needed a hand. We also learned to respect our elders and authority figures. It is too bad our nation has currently lost some of its ability to respect each other and people of different ethnic backgrounds. I believe all of us did that in the communities that surrounded the Bonner School. No more preaching. Some people, some of the people who had a big impact on my development beside my parents and my relatives, namely the Leans and McCloskeys, were Grant Higgins, W.F. Aiken, and the Bonner School faculty, Carrie Pleasant, Mary LaForge, Dorney Dornberger, and Ada Fuller. Please note that several mothers made a, were a big influence on me as they were with the rest of the kids growing up in Bonner. I remember some of the nicknames that were used. Of course, most of the boys had to have one and the respect level dropped a wee bit as you will see. I remember Lefty, Duke, Casey, Snitz, Snags, Stein, Snubby, Fubba, Fubba Baggers, Baggiers, Muleers, Rocket, Donuts, Runt, Goosey, Weenie, and Bumps. <laughs> it says Lefty Pleasant will remember more I am sure, as he had a better current memory of Bonner than most of us our age. <laughs> Grant Higgins hasn't gotten the credit he deserves for all he did for the kids of Bonner. He taught us to safely swim, ski, skate, get along in the woods, and even box. A great man who should be remembered in your proceedings today. I'm not sure this story happened exactly as I remember it, but it will illustrate the kind of people we had in Bonner. There was a man named Oleolene who worked in the boiler room, which was the main source of power for the mill. There was some kind of breakdown, and following the repairs, Ole turned in a timesheet for 24 hours of work in a 24-hour period. When questioned as to whether he didn't eat or rest during that time, Ole responded that there wasn't time for that, as the mill wasn't going to run unless he made the repairs. He was known around the office after that as 24-hour Ole. I don't know if they ever paid him for 24 hours or not, but I suspect they did. Ada Fuller was a hero as far as I'm concerned. This was, she was the first and only mom at that time, to the rest of, best of my knowledge, that drove an automobile around Bonner. Of course, Earl, her husband, had to replace some pickets in the fence a time or two <laughs> when she parked in the narrow, narrow alley. Ada was an amazing woman, and I liked her. I delivered the evening paper for a number of years, and I had a customer named Helen McMurray. The cost of the paper was 18 cents for six days. Mrs. McMurray made me collect every week, and then made me guess the dates on the three pennies before she would give them to me. <laughs> it was fun for her, but not for me. There are many more positive memories of the people of Bonner that I'm sure will be related by others. I have lived and worked in several locations around the United States and know how fortunate I was to have grown up in Bonner and Western Montana. If you are interested in Bonner and other communities around Bonner School, be sure to get and read The Story of Bonner, Montana by Jack Demons, a great read. Wally Otterson. Okay, I'll jump into any questions so far on Wally. 
Okay, I'm going to jump into to when I came into town, and then after that, why, there are so many great stories, I'm sure, here. We'll pass the microphone around, and we'll, we'll collect as many of these as we can, and I, I'm really looking forward to them. The first time I saw this quaint little town, it was a company town. It was in the spring of 1948. We come out here to look at the town. There was going to be a job opening. Uh, Sam Kemi was due to retire, and there was going to be a job opening for the uh, maintenance man for the old steam locomotive. That was 1246. And, of course, it was a place that uh, my mother and my stepdad decided would be a cool place, so they made arrangements, and in uh, late 49 and 50, we loaded up an old sock truck full of everything that they had, and we moved to Bonner. Uh, by that time, old Harry Truman was president of the United States. H.F. Root, that's Bill's grandpa, he was the manager of the mill. And if you'd have driven a Ford lately, it would have probably been a 1950 purchase from H.O. Bell in Missoula. And the best example I know of that old car is driven by Bill and Gene Walker. If you've seen that old car running around here, it is probably nicer than those sold at, at the dealership. Uh, I lived in a railroad house, which is gone. And Lefty was telling me some of, the, some of the folks that lived there before I did, so you know that was a revelation for me today. But uh, that house is located just about where you the crossing crosses 200 up here as you head up into the Blackfoot Valley. Uh, a little bit on my parents. My mother had just recently married old Tom Henley. <laughs> and I still to this day don't know how that ever happened, but <laughs> she did. <laughs> <laughs> he took care of the old steam engine out here. He was a little bit different, but uh, he done a fairly good job on that old locomotive. But the marriage was slowly failing. It was going downhill and downhill, and finally, when the Milwaukee went out of business, then the house, they quit maintaining the house, and he was invited to find occupancy somewhere else other than water. So that left me right about teenage years. I had a hell of a spirit of adventure. I wanted to go out there and just grab a hold of this world, see what made it tick. So during this time, I didn't have a, a dad that could, you know, that could show me how to fish or hunt, but the kids, my neighbors, Ed, Ike, Bill, we had some great times. I think we taught ourselves. Uh, Yankee Doodle Rock, <laughs> Sheep Herder's Trail, Woodchopper's Cabin, Johnson Creek, great memories there. And. Uh, when I finally did uh, decide, well, it's time for me to head out of water and find something new, you know, I, I, I went out there, I discovered, well, first off, I joined the National Guard. And the prison blew up, the prison riot. And I thought to myself, damn it to hell, I didn't join up. So I go over there and have a bunch of clowns take a shot at me. You know, I don't know whether it's such a good move or not. Bonner looked pretty good then. So I came back here and I went to work. And one of the things I learned from the folks out here in Bonner was they firmly believed in an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. And like I mentioned in the last meeting we had, uh, Anton Iverson come up to me and uh, I was beginning to feel the, the pressure of that green chain. And he told me, he says, this is where the men work. If you can't handle a base, go home to your mommy. Well, I wasn't about to do that. <laughs> so I stayed on for another 45 years. Uh, <laughs> work like hell. But one of the finest supervisors I had is sitting right beside me here, Lefty. He was more of a team leader rather than, he had one fellow down there, I'll just refer to him as Uncle Donald. <laughs> he was a tyrant. Hey, Caesar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Lefty, on the other hand, him and Roy Robinson was two people that led that crew, saying, we have this kind of a job to do, 
we're going to do it. And I think for a long time, we held the safety record, the shipping department, year after year after year. It almost got repetitious. Here come the, the photographer, take our pictures, we get our award. And it was all because we believed in that shipping department, we believed in Lefty, and it was just a great place to work. Uh, Ed's brother, Stan, Ed and Shirley, worked there shipping for a while. Worked night shift on the paper wrap crew. But anyway, uh, I eventually came to retire. One of my fondest memories is a grand old Willie's night. And I think that's one of my inspirations for this 69 Ford that I restored. And Bill and I have talked many times on his restoration of his old 50, and we always managed to come back to Ed's dad. The story he told me about when he first got that old car, uh, he got it for him and his family and his wife, and he told me a little bit about the great stories that he had while driving this old car. And I thought, damn, I'd like to relive that. I'd like to capture that. So when my wife says, I'm going to buy this little 69 Mustang, which we almost had to bring it home in the bushel basket. But the restoration of that finally became reality. And the first time I stepped into that car, it's all ready to go. It even smells like one of the new ones. Closed that door. We took that trip. When those doors closed, it was 1969 all over again. You could almost hear the music of the time in your ears. Uh, you had this urge to go downtown to a drive-in, get a hamburger from a car hop. You know, and we still do this. We did this last year. So what a, what a great way to preserve a great memory. And that's one of, the, one of the better ones I have of Bonner. So that's my story on Bonner. Other than that, uh, uh, for some people refer to me as the Bonner hooligan. Because we did, we did pull some shenanigans out here. <laughs> Not as bad as we did. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there was, uh, after, after I moved out of water, I had a chance. We gathered up some old timers again. And Mike Waddington sitting back here brought his mom in. And Lou had a, uh, she had a sense of humor that wouldn't quit. But Mike told stories he was a generation behind us, Bill and Ed and I, told the same damn stories. <laughs> Running young Karkin and ragging around town, you know, <laughs> turning off street lights and just, just playing hooliganism. But it was fun. It was a kind of a Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn type of environment. Something I wouldn't trade for all the, for all the experiences in the world. This was a very special place out here. So with that, if anybody has any other stories, uh, now's the time. Oops, Jim. Marie, Marie uh, sitting next to you. Marie. Marie, you wanna you wanna be next on the? Okay. Okay, I'll pass you this down. Um, my grandparents came. And with the family in 1900, and um, on, and my dad uh, worked. It was Harry, Harry Lean. If anybody remembers him working in the store, and um, we lived in a, a little house just west of the. Uh, what is now the post office, I think. Okay. Uh, but it, it was a roundhouse then. The, uh, mo the, mo the uh, um, motor car went around the... the About our history center now. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was born on 9 9 1917 And um, shortly after that, my dad was... Um, uh, diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis and Eva my sister had been born by that time also and we left Bonner my parents sold everything they had to make the be able to travel down to 
Phoenix, Arizona. I was in the third grade. And I remember, who remembers Miss Beetle? <laughs> she was our teacher, our third grade teacher, Miss Beetle. Oh, Mem yes. Remember her? Yeah. Yes. I remember them all. And, um, <laughs> she, she was, uh, yeah, she was strict. There was no doubt about that. No monkey business, Lifty. You and Wally. A anyway, um, you weren't born yet when we left and went to Arizona. <laughs> and after, my, after we'd been down there a month, my dad finally was able to get an appointment with a specialist and found out that it was a misdiagnosis. He didn't have tuberculosis. And so we started moving north, and my mother dragging her feet the whole way. She said, we're not going back to Bonner. There are too many liens there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they live just across the street, across the road from where we lived when we were there before. But there was no place in all the world that was more precious to my dad, Harry, in Bonner, Montana. And uh, so he prevailed. And we came back and we moved into uh, one of the houses lefty on the, the uh, what would it be, the west side of the street that uh, there were two or three cottages that were about the same. Do you remember those? It was right across the street from where Wally lived. And when we came back from Arizona, that was the first news that we got that that uh, my Aunt Helen had had a baby boy named Wally. Wow. <laughs> and the next day, the lady across the street, Mrs. Pleasant, had given birth to a, a boy named Lefty. <laughs> oh, he got that name later, you know. That wasn't his name. I think it was Eugene. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> I shouldn't have told that. You, Somebody might call you Eugene. <laughs> uh, but uh, when we came back, that was the first news that we had gotten that, that my Aunt Helen had had a baby boy. And she had named him Wallace, Wally. And the next day, Jean's mother across the street gave birth to Jean. And those two were pals for all the growing up years. Had the same interests. And uh, Wally was an only child. Jean, you had a bro older brother, didn't you? Yes, he was about your age. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was in school with you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, think, I think he was in your sister's class. Right in there. Yeah. My sister's class? He was yeah. in Eva's I, class? I think so. Uh huh. He was in the, yeah. Because uh, he was 14 years older than I was. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, you were a surprise, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> we had a cabin on Placid Lake. You figured the rest out. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, my mother didn't want to come back to Bonner because it's just too much family for her. Uh, but there was no place on earth that my dad wanted to be was it Bonner, Montana. No matter where he was, that's where he wanted to be. And um, uh, 
he was killed in an accident on Brook Street many years later. And so he lived and died in the place that he loved. And so it's fun to come back and, and see the changes that have been made. We had a school that had was two story, four four grades on the on the first level and four grades on the top level, and we had um, uh, when you got to the eighth grade, the girls had uh, cooking classes, and uh, we had to uh, at the end of the course we had to serve uh, a five course dinner to the board of directors. <coughs> And the boys had um, manual training. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Aiken was the prof was the principal of the school, and he was stern. Of are, are, are you nodding your head? <laughs> he <don't>. was stern, <laughs> and the, the boys didn't get away with anything. You remember him? Yes, uh, I remember, I think I was about in the third grade when he quit using a razor strap on different individuals. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me, I know who they are, but I don't <laughs> <laughs> Some of the kinfolk are here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was no, no monkey business in school. We were there to learn, and, and that was it. And... Um, we were fully prepared to go into Missoula to into the high school when we left the Bonner School. It was a good school. And um, while Mr. Aiken was very stern, um, he, 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 was a good, he was a good leader. And I, I have some pictures here of old time and um, I was born, I don't know, did I say, am I repeating myself? Yeah, that happens when you get old, you know. <laughs> uh, I was born in that house that's just west of, of the, of the, what is it, the post of us now, right there in the middle of, of uh, okay. the town. And, um, my sister was born in Missoula, but with my parents were still living in that house. And it was after that then that we made our trek to Arizona and came back with my mother dragging her feet the whole way. And uh, her parents had a, a farm in the Tarkio area down between Superior and Alberton. And so, um, there was no house for us in Bonner, and we couldn't live anywhere else. We had to live in Bonner, and so um, my sister and my mother and I stayed with my grandparents then for the summer. And my mother said she didn't want to come back to Bonner. She didn't want to come back to Bonner. <laughs> too many liens, too many liens. <laughs> and uh, but, like I said, there was no other place on the planet that was was a place that my father loved to be. So that's where we came back, and that's where he was when he was killed. He was in the in the place where he wanted to be. Outstanding. Yeah. Uh, Glenn. We have uh, Mr. Aiken's granddaughter here. Maybe she'd like you to say a word or two. Oh, <laughs> super. I'd love to hear that. I'm Marie Stempke Paul, and I'm William F. Aiken's granddaughter, Jean Aiken's daughter. And I think you can hear me, can't you? Some of us are dead. <laughs> <laughs> But I love to hear the stories about my grandfather because my mother always had stories about how strict he was. 
And I would love to hear more. I heard a lot of stories. Of, and many of these people I recognize as classmates from Missoula County High, too. Um, he, um, she talked about um, Walter Hook a lot. And I don't, I'm sure there are those of you who remember him. Uh, many of the names I'm already hearing were names that Mother talked about when she went to the 50-year reunion and working on that from her bond of classmates. My grandfather, they lived in the Lower Rattlesnake, and he insisted she went to school with him in Bonner. So she, this, is, this is home to her and the Bonner family. We spent a lot of time driving through the area, heard a lot about it. So I would love to hear William F. Aiken stories. It would, would thrill me to death, I'm sure, that uh, I knew he was strict, but I, I never heard about the razor strap. <laughs> And believe me, I was a hellion on the Lower East Side, too, so I know what that's like. So anybody that has stories, I would love to hear them also. Talking about uh, W.F. Kagan, uh, it was the eighth grade then, and uh, he came out to pitch. We were playing softball. He came out to pitch. So he took off his coat, and I can still see the vest and his shirt on and his tie, and he came out to pitch, and he, I was the batter. And he threw one, and I just about hit him between the eyes of the ball. It just, he ducked in time. And I thought I was going to get the razor strap. But anyhow, there's many stories there. I want to say about Wally, my close friend for so many years. Uh, some of the stories, I can tell them all day on him and I, but we don't. But uh, I'll never forget one night, we were seniors in high school, and you know, we were just like any of the rest of the kids, kind of mischievous. He says, Lefty, how can we get some beer? And I says, well, I'll make a note out and you sign your dad's <coughs> name on it. In those days, you could. You could take the bar and give him a note. If you betcha. We had, the, we had the Bonner Roundhouse going. That was a bar. But we went to Milltown because they all knew us at the Bonner Roundhouse. And we figured at Milltown, at Mel's Bar, the Midway they called it at that time, no one knew us, which they didn't. So we got the beer. And we didn't get drunk or nothing. We were just being kids, you know. I didn't like it to start with. So, uh, and another time, uh, many stories we could tell. I had this BB gun my brother brought me, I guess I was about in the seventh grade then, and Wally was across the street at his house, and I was in my backyard, and he says, I'll bend over and I bet you can't hit me in the butt, and boy, did I hit him in the butt with that BB gun. <laughs> and he, he told me afterwards, he says, I didn't know you were that good of a shot. <laughs> and uh, I like what, <coughs> I call him Billy. That's what we called him when I was a kid, Billy Wilbur. But he said he pretty well covered the house in Bonner. I'm going to name a couple places, though, that I think we kind of forgot uh, along with all this talking. How many remember the Bonner bunkhouse? That was down by the river by the barn. And uh, years ago, they tore it down. And I think, if I remember right, uh, they had a cook there. Wilson was his last name. They had two boys. They were ahead of me in grade school. And right alongside of that, in there was the ice house, and somebody said, well, what was the ice house for? I said, well, in those days, we all had the old refrigerators. We know nothing electric. We had to use the ice, call them the ice boxes. So, uh, and then along in there, too, was the shops of uh, Stokey. He revised some trucks and made them so they could haul lumber. And, uh, and then along in there, I told us to, I think, Brigham, and I'm not sure, but down in there somewhere, I can't remember this too much, was the, the pig pens for the company and the horse barns and all that were down that far corner. Because the reason I remember, because we lived right about in the middle of Bonner, and when we went out the back there, we were in the, in the old football field. Lou Breck, when he was manager, he built a football field for us because his son liked to play football. So uh, and it had a big high fence around it, and we'd play football. I remember the time we played East Missoula, and Bob Johnson's here, and and we should have never played him because Bob ran all over us, but we, we thought we were tough in Bonner. <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I guess that's about all I got to say on that part. And then there was the Bonner Roundhouse, and that was quite interesting. Uh, I remember just a little bit about, that was the roundhouse where the streetcars came, turned around, headed back to Missoula. And I remember a little bit about it, getting off of the streetcar with my mother, and she was holding on to my hand and all that. But there was a lot of stories about it. But, 
The back there was a bar, and then the other side was living quarters. Up in the front was a soda fountain, and then the other side was the barber shop. And uh, it was kind of a hangout, and of course we, us kids would get kicked out there once in a while, we'd get a little rowdy, but uh, it was quite interesting in those days. So, as far as the rest of the houses go, I, uh, I lived in one close to Marie's dad when I first got married about 1956, I think I was Marie's dad's neighbor. And Harry taught me a lot, plus in Sunday school. Marie taught me in Sunday school too. She didn't teach me anything, but that's all right. <laughs> uh, I lived next to Harry, and uh, Harry would give me a lot of the history, how he came from, he was working in the woods years ago, and how they came down in stagecoach from Sealy Lake. And I, that was something, you know. And then uh, he told me too that the last four houses, the pictures are in the paper this morning, those last four houses in Bonner were the last new ones. But there was one new one since then because uh, the house next to us, they tore it down and built a new one there right after the war in 46, right from the bottom up, the whole thing. And uh, that picture was in the paper this morning, which I was glad to see. So that's about all I got to say, I guess. Thanks. <laughs> Outstanding. <laughs> The last house there is was built for the Lean family. You know, when they came, uh, my grandfather had come earlier and was working as uh, down in the office. And uh, then the family came. They, we always celebrated June 30th because that was the day the Leans landed in Bonner. And uh, my dad was never the same after that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it it was Bonner. Uh, Bonner was Bonner was the only place on the face of the earth that that he was really happy. Uh, 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 Lois, we get you to talk again. <laughs> I have to defend the girls in Bonner. We weren't as bad as the boys. <laughs> right? This is, this is the church laws. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not telling any lies. I think there's some real interesting things about Bonner that's being passed up. Um, and I'm almost as old as Marie, but not quite, so I came as a baby too. But the mill, being in a mill town with mill houses, I didn't even realize was so different until after I grew up. For one thing, um, the things they did for us, uh, the store was, they sent someone around to the women who didn't drive because even though my mother drove young, she, they weren't, she wasn't driving then. They took the orders from the ladies, I don't know how many times a week, and then in the afternoon they delivered the groceries to your house. Uh, this is like three blocks probably away, and uh, I didn't think that was unusual. Uh, you know, after I got married and we took care of all the things that were free in Bonner, watering the lawn, the river water was pumped up. Uh, we had, uh, well, everybody bought their own fuel and they paid their own electric bills after we did get electricity. And <laughs> it was just a really, I think, amazing way to live because I've never lived in a mill town since. And one of the things, and you hear Grant Higgins bouncing around when you're talking. We lived right across the street from that beautiful hotel. And of course, Grant lived in the hotel. We only got to go in it when we could go to the library. There was a library in one of the big sitting rooms. And after work, or at work time when it ended, to wait for Grant Higgins to take us swimming. And we'd go in and wait by the stairway downstairs till he came. He must have looked like the Pied Piper of Bonner going, walking up to the river with all these kids, kids hanging along with him. And uh, we, 
Every night he took us swimming. He taught us all how to swim, and to my knowledge, nobody drowned during this time. When we got older and could go out and walk on the logs where we were not supposed to go, we had a couple of mishaps, but, you know, the girls didn't do the things you guys did. Can I interrupt you? Yes, you sure You were can. one of them. You fell through one. Oh. Gosh, my I'm husband's serious. back here. My daughter. I didn't think we disobeyed, but... Um. <laughs> did you ever jump off to that big rock? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, the cliff up the there. Oh. Into the water. That was after Grant Higgins was looking out for us, I think. <laughs> I, he wouldn't have taken us. If we didn't mind, he wouldn't have taken us again. And he was really great about that. The company was really great about, I think, of Christmas. They always gave you know, the people who lived in the houses, they gave them a 100-pound bag of sugar, a 100-pound bag of flour. Uh, somebody was telling me they I remembered a box of, chocolate. of chocolates, and they gave and a bag the, of oranges. Well, a bag of oranges, and the school they gave the little mesh bags of nuts and candy and an orange for all the students and. Um, my family still have to have an orange in their stockings. That was a real treat. And they just they just did that because we were their family. We had lots to do. Behind our house was the hill, and we could do a lot up on the mountain, you know, uh, picking wildflowers and then looking for wood ticks when you got home. Don't forget the skating rink. Don't forget the skating rink. I, I wasn't going to Lefty. Okay. We used to slide on the hill. Um, Nan Newport lived next door to me. I was lucky because it was all boys around and she and I were the same age. Uh, she was, I talked to her not long ago and she was reminding me we, my dad made a big toboggan and we'd go up on the hill and there were two ways you could come down off that hill and we were not allowed down one side that was very dangerous because you went over the cliff into the gravel pit. But she did say, and of course I don't remember that, <laughs> don't tell me I did it, we, uh, <laughs> we would apparently ride down the side we weren't supposed to and then we'd all bail off and let the toboggan go and it would go down over. But we had a wonderful skating rink and the reason we did was the water towers were right up on the hill behind it. Um, my dad and some of the dads managed to get some old fire hoses from down at the mill and hooked them up up there and they'd go out at night and late and would flood the rink. We had to take care of it. We had to uh, shovel the snow off of it. They didn't do that for us. Later, uh, quite a while later, the company put a great big floodlight right out on the bank that would flood over across to there. And we just spent a lot of hours, always had a big bonfire. And no, Glenn, it wasn't me who stole the oil waste out of the train cars. <laughs> But I know it made a really good fire. <laughs> good <one. laughs> it could not right away. There were, I would probably say, if you could talk to the mothers in Bonner, um, there were probably a lot of uh, boots and shoes and gloves and hats that got burned up in the fire because you wouldn't want to go home when you were wet and cold. You always got a little closer to the fire. <laughs> that wasn't too good. <clears throat> one of the things that... Um, I remember a lot was, and and this sounds crazy in this world, but I loved the teepee burner. We lived right across the road from the big hotel, and from my bedroom I could watch the teepee burner at night, and it was like watching fireworks. I thought it was wonderful, and didn't know it was probably not good for me to have it. The women of the town complained when they lit it in the daytime, you know, there wasn't automatic wash machines and dryers, so when white sheets are out on the line and they started up that teepee burner, <clears throat> there was some discussion about that around <laughs> among the mothers. But we had, we really had a lot of things to do. Um, somewhere I read that Bonner did not have a bar, but you, Lefty mentioned it, there was a bar, Bill Howell's 
what you call it, Bill's place, wasn't it? Down at the roundhouse. And uh, that wasn't anything bad. Uh, we kids could go down there and go in the candy part and the ice cream. Penny candy anymore isn't anything like it was at that time. Uh, back to Grant Higgins, though, do you guys remember that he took us once a year up the river in the old bateau. I'm not sure what a bateau was, but it was a huge, big old thing that looked like a canoe, didn't it? It was something they it, used. It was in the made it like a French, French, French boat. He filled it all and up they, with they the, all of us. Me, they used it for logging. Years ago oh, too. was that? Yeah. Well, I guess that was probably its reason down there. But yeah. we'd go up the river, uh, probably all the way up to the first bend up there or somewhere, have a wiener roast. He always took the things, and if we'd had a good summer, he'd do that. When we'd come down, it'd be almost dark, and coming around the bend and into Bonner and seeing that teepee burner again was just lighting our way home. It was really amazing. That man devoted his life to the young people in Bonner. We were really lucky, I think. But anyway, those were a few of the things. And one more. The, and a lot of people don't know this about Bonner and the Bonner store. Um, the men or the families, and I might be wrong on some of this, probably am, they bought their groceries there, but uh, it was taken out of the paychecks as their rent was taken out of the paychecks. And the one thing that I was always excited about when I was big enough, we could go down there and buy a coupon book for $20, whatever, whatever our parents stole or whatever they wanted. Then it was also charged to their, their uh, bill. And we shopped at the Missoula Mercantile. The Missoula Mercantile was in connection with it. I thought that was the most exciting day of my life. We'd get on the streetcar or the bus, excuse me, the bus. Right. We always had one of those and go to town and go shopping at the Mercantile. And uh, I don't think I've ever met anyone else in my life that ever lived like that. They, they'd look at me and say, well, that's not being free, you know, you, Somebody was ruling you and you had to buy their things. No, we didn't have to, but they also had huge gardens down near the football field, right? right. <laughs> and the gardens, all that water was free. Our garbage was hauled free. Uh, rent, I think, when, when I left in 48, I heard Glenn was coming, so I got out of town. <laughs> I didn't even know him until the last couple of years, and we've had a lot of fun talking over Bonner. But um, at that time, uh, now I lost my train of thought to give you a bad time. <laughs> anyway, I guess uh, there's just a lot of things about Bonner that probably I don't even still understand, but that's what a real company town is, and uh, they took care of us. I, I was like all teenagers. It wasn't such a fun place when you got to high school. Um, I did get to date a wonderful guy from East Missoula, and the buses came and went around, picked us up, took us back, and. So we got to do things. We got to go to all the school things. The school bus came, and I uh, guess we really didn't miss much, I don't think. Uh, after living in Missoula 25 years after that, I sure was glad to get back out in the area. I was baptized, and Bob and I were married in this church right here, so uh, this is home to me. A lot of my good friends, though, moved away and lived somewhere else. I didn't envy them. I thought it was okay here, so. Anyway, I've talked to Thanks, Thanks Lois. <laughs> Good was, to see you. I was at your wedding. Yes, I know you were. <laughs> <laughs> I said I wouldn't tell any more stories, so I won't tell any of them. Uh, I've got one to, to finish up with uh, Lois's dad. And Bill and Ed and I, I think we can all remember that man would take us and plunk us up on the seat of an old farm old cub in the back alley and we learned how to drive a tractor you know and, and he didn't have to do this but he did 
And one of the one of the cool things about living out here is, you know, the, the different guys that took an interest in a bunch of ragtag kids. And uh, another, well, I'm talking to machines, and I got the floor here for a second. I want to talk about another individual who left it, uh, a mark on my life, and his daughter sitting right back here, Donna. <laughs> And Bob Barta had, uh, the first time I saw him, he had an old Indian motorcycle that, uh, boy, he'd fix on that thing and go tear it up the Blackfoot, and then half hour later, why, you'd see Mary jump in the Dodge and go up and get him, drag him back home. <laughs> but the one thing that he built that totally amazed me, I think it should have. It should have taken hold, but Bob was way ahead of his time. He built this contraption with an airplane engine, and it looked like a swamp boat that you see on uh, CSI Miami, but it worked <laughs> on skis. And he built it in an old red garage up here behind the, where the post office sits now. And I remember walking by that garage, looking in there, thinking, what in the blazes is this guy doing? One Saturday morning, there was this god-awful roar come down that back alley, and here's Bob sitting in this thing. The airplane motor wound out tight, and he's smoking down that back alley. There's a hurricane of snow in behind him. He come down to that vacant lot right behind your place there where I lived, made a turn, went back up to the, the garage. Well, hell, I was in a state of shock. I had never seen anything like that. But this guy had the brass to put something like that together and jump on it and ride it. <laughs> so what, what a colorful character Bob was. I wanted to bring that up along with Earl and his tractor because there was things that went on out here that was glorious. I think also Floyd Baird and Earl built a snowmobile that was a little bit different. It had a big tractor wheel and a chain in between it. And it made its maiden voyage down the alley, but came back up in several pieces. <laughs> the last I remember of it, it was back at Earl's garage, which I think was the old livery stable for the hotel. And it was back to the drawing boards on that one, but boy, that one Bob had, holy cow, could that thing smoke up a snowdrift. <laughs> okay, that's, that's enough of my rattling for now. I need to turn this over to some, because there are some great stories out here, and I would love to have somebody else tell us one. Any takers? Got awful quiet. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to mention, uh, oh. you mentioned uh, Ole Olin, and I distinctly remember, like he started here in 1914, retired in 64, 50 years of service. And I was telling this girl that story once, and she said, oh, I can't believe that, that's hard to believe. But the thing is, too, back in them days, they started at the mill when they were 14 and 15 years old. So it wouldn't be that hard to get 50 years in. But I just wanted to mention Ole, because I know that he had 50 years in out here. Yes, he had a long service record. And he was, he was kind of the guy, he was the guy that you, he was very impressionable as far as I was concerned. On his own time, he cleaned off this end of Water Mountain from where the where we slid on the on our sleigh riding hill back towards the crossing. He cleaned what about eighty percent of that off. It looked like a park up in there. He didn't have to do it, but when he was done, damn, that was nice up through there. Uh, there were a few big brush piles. But other than that, you could look up through there. You know, it was was cleaned out. Of course, I've mentioned his old car time and time again. I did have one good adventure last summer. I called up Ed and I says, whatever became of the car? Talked to Shirley a little bit about it. They remembered it going to a collector in Kalispell, so I jumped right on that and I located the collector, but he had died. And he says they, his family sold the car. So I got a hold of some folks at Zip Auto that thought they might have an idea where it went. And they told me, they said, check Prey, Montana, over there by Livingston. So I got a hold of those folks over there, and they says, oh yeah, that's the car. 
it's the one you're looking for. Well, by the time I met with those folks, it wasn't the car. It was a year older than Ed's and Shirley's car. But the adventure that I had in, in tracing that, even though it was the wrong car, <laughs> was spectacular. I mean, uh, the fellow that owns three of these Willie's Knights lives right below Bridger Peak. And if I didn't know better when I went into his yard, I thought I was in Dennis Washington's yard. This man was wealthy and spared no cost on restoring these old cars. They were probably in better shape than when they come out of the, the showroom. So what a great adventure that was. I had planned to stop and see Stan, that's it, and Shirley's brother. But uh, the time we went through there was just wrong. You know, uh, Stan was a good friend of mine, but if I had contacted him that time of the morning there, <laughs> he'd have run me off with a gun. <laughs> so that was, that was a great adventure there. And of course, like I say, Bill and Gene, you know, I mentioned this before, I don't think there's a summer went by in the past three or four that we haven't planned out a trip. The last one I thought was rather neat. We even stayed on the old highway system that was around. You know, we could have got on the freeway, you know, and hustled along with the modern traffic, but we got actually went into the old highways, had lunch in, uh, where do we have lunch in? P in Peaburg, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, Phillipsburg up there, yeah. So again, you know, just, just spin-off stories from when I was a kid out here and how I like to preserve them. And that's kind of the reason for me now to be involved to the degree I am. Because if you look at the headlines today, uh, some big shot has run off to Jamaica with half the nation's life savings thinking he's entitled to it. The hell with the working guy. You know, we never had that. And back in Bonner days, I mean, it was hard work and honest days pay and honest days. You know, we didn't do all that so we could rip everybody off and go to Jamaica. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac could kiss my whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and what it took for me, because I was always been kind of a kind of a hooligan. I wanted a house just like anybody else, but I'll be damned if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac was going to have a finger in that pie. The <laughs> out that I had that helped me up was Lefty right here. The lumber that Lefty sold me Did enabled me to it? build that house. Did I really charge you for it? <laughs> that was all right. <laughs> Lefty was the easiest lumber broker in the world to deal with. If you find a load of lumber. That's because I'd been to Harold's Club for beer and burger. <laughs> <laughs> Say, hey, Lefty, I got this load of lumber out here. What do you got to have? Oh, hell, 20 bucks. <laughs> So that's how I can say, Fatty Bay, kiss my, okay, back there. Hi. My name's Doug Britt, and that doesn't mean anything to anybody, uh, because, is this on? No? Okay. <coughs> I just um, happened to see in the newspaper that you were having a get-together, and so I decided to sneak over from the rattlesnake where I had to grow up just to see what Bonner was like. I had to live with people like Dennis Sane and his wife. <coughs> and, um, but as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about something that occurred many years ago. You had the Margaret Hotel, and it was decided that it was going to be torn down, and you had a furniture sale. And a woman who was a neighbor of mine named Cyril Van Duzer, who was associated with the university, went to this sale and she bought a dresser. And the dresser um, was a, obviously a very nice dresser since it came such, from such a nice hotel. And the dresser also had a mirror, which was this big square, it looked like it was a, a walnut frame, 
It was square and it had a circular mirror in the center that was beveled. And it just occurred to me, did anyone else go to that sale and buy a dresser? Raise your hand. One person here, two. Okay. The dresser was delivered to Cyril Van Duzer's house on Duncan Drive and the Rattlesnake. And they unloaded the dresser in her garage and carried in the mirror and layered up against the wall. And a month later, she got some boys to haul the dresser into her bedroom. And then they grabbed the mirror. And the mirror was bigger than the dresser. And it dawned on her, they dropped off the wrong mirror. And so after several years, she phoned me. And she said, would you like a really nice mirror? And so I bought it from her and put it in my bedroom, just hanging on the wall over a radiator. Does anyone have a dresser that doesn't have the right mirror? <laughs> oh, OK, so evidently, uh, I've got, uh, I, I, I've always wondered, you know, this has been, how many years has the market been torn down? 40 years? Well, anyway, I've been living with this, uh, you know, thing for 40 years. And I just happened to think, gee, maybe somebody would like to trade mirrors or dressers or something. <laughs> Thank you very much. but I can remember <laughs> taking a paper up to uh, Zeph Space in the Marguerite Hotel in the mornings. And, uh, oh, it was just wonderful growing up here. Uh, jumping off of that rock that you talked about into the river, <coughs> go, walking across the railroad trestle and looking for rattlesnakes. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I've feel very fortunate to have grown up here. You know, and, and, and adding to this, my youngest daughter, we live in Clinton, my youngest daughter always refers to one of her favorite school teachers, Mrs. Hadley. <laughs> <laughs> she speaks very highly of you. So, you know, we really contributed not only to the local area here, but up Clinton Place too. And in my daughter's eyes, I think you're way up here. <laughs> you have something to say about mine? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, Um, I don't have a whole lot to say. It was just a good town to grow up in. Uh, I was known as the meanest girl in Bonner. I think Bill he could vouch for that. <laughs> um, the boys would pick on me and I would just beat them up. So I was just known to be the meanest one. Uh, um, my grandparents grew up in Bonner, and they loved it. When they moved to Milltown, then we moved into their house, house number 72. And we were, I was there till I was 18. And it was just a good town to grow up, and everybody cared for everybody. And there's a difference today. Um, you know, it's nice just to Go knock on somebody's door and visit them without having an appointment, where today you have to have an appointment, which isn't 
too good. <laughs> but everybody was great. Um, uh, the Jacobsons and the Foolers, and I know um, Lois's dad used to out in their shed. He had it fixed up a like a cute little place, and he would uh, have that um, wind-up phonograph going for his kids. And he would take a sleigh riding, and they'd have snacks, and it just, it meant a lot. And I can, I can still remember a lot of people from Bonner. A lot of them are gone now, but I still think of them. It was a great to uh, town to grow up in. Thank you. I didn't grow up in Bonner per se, but I was right across the tracks at the very north end of the Duck Bridge. Graduated from the school here in 1947 with Jim Willis, and uh, Rick was just a year ahead of us. My father worked for the mill for 42 years, was on the school board when they built the gymnasium here. Um, anyway, a couple of names that I haven't heard today that uh, were around a long time. One was Joe Bouchard. Lois made mention of the company delivering flour and, and uh, oranges and things at Christmas time, but they also gave out turkeys at Thanksgiving time, as I recall. The other one was Art Leite, better known as Buck Leite, and he delivered all the wood to the school. He used to burn wood four foot lengths at the school, and uh, I don't know if Mr. Dufresne piled all that himself or Leo uh, was there at that time, George Otto maybe, I don't know who all, uh, maybe some of the kids did it also. Another thing that I haven't heard anything about was the Hoover Trail that was built here many, many years ago. Uh, went, it's kind of like the bridge that went to nowhere. It went up in a draw back here and that was the end of it. But I guess it gave work during the Second World War to the CC boys or WPA or whatever, I'm not sure. but. Um, I, uh, I've thought about this group many a times. I've seen uh, it on TV. I also went to school under Mr. Aiken, and then I worked with his granddaughter for many years. Actually, her dad was working when I first went to work at the post office, and he shortly thereafter retired, but Marie and I worked together for many years at the post office, so it's good to see you again, Marie. A few here know me, and I'm not from Bonner, but what I'm hearing is a time. I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts, but much of what I've heard today is very much like what I remember growing up. Nobody had electric refrigerators. The ice man came around, and the wagon was pulled by horses when I was a youngster. I sold newspapers for three cents a piece, and the real high-priced folks would give you a nickel and let you keep the change. Uh, so much of what I'm hearing is a time that those of us that have been around this world a while grew up in. And places other than Bonner had very much of the sort of things that I'm hearing from everybody here today. Uh, Jim Hobbick, retired plant ecology professor, and I hear people coughing in the audience here. And I'm wondering why Bonner was such a good place when the houses were so close together, all burning wood, and the teepee burners burning wood, and the school burning wood. What the hell were you guys breathing? <laughs> That's a rhetorical question, but I, I want to see about 10 hands answering that question. I got one. We had lots of forts around here, and if there was a pack of Lucky Strike cigarettes that wasn't claimed, we tested them. <laughs> <laughs> Along with the cinders and the smoke. 
<laughs> and a Highlander beer if we could find somebody to get us one. <laughs> I know the angles, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think somebody also should marry, uh, mention George and Clara Buckhouse. They uh, had a wonderful cafe. I happened to work there for a while. Um, you know, when we would have a ball game at the Bonner School, we always went to the Bonner Cafe afterwards, and he'd always let us dance, or, you know, music was going and stuff, and we all. So I think that they were really an uh, asset to our community also. Um, they, they, were, they were there for a long time and they gave a lot of young girls an opportunity to work and make a little bit of money on the side. So I do want them to be recognized also. Anybody here remember him? <laughs> That's so incredible. He was he was a strip. This he 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 tolerated no no bad things at all. I mean, you couldn't do anything without that. You'd have to go stand in the corner or go down to the. Basement or do something in uh, he, he, he was a strict uh, teacher. And it led uh, Miss Brown, Miss. Uh, who remember her? Who remember her? Yeah. And she was our art teacher. Uh, who would think that in a town like Bonner, you know, off the main track and everything, would have a, a teacher that would teach us art? Um, and we always had something to take home to show for our artists. Did you, did you take the art from her? Not from her, but uh, when I was in school, the uh, principal we had put the fear of God in me, anyway. <laughs> his name was Lightfoot. And I think his, one of his hands was missing. The rumor had it that if you goofed off, he'd haul you upstairs in that principal's office, hold you down with that arm without the hand, and then he'd beat the hell out of you with a rubber hose. <laughs> I was terrified of that man. Somebody, somebody said I had to go to see the principal one night. I remember I took off on a dead run. I run right smack into the damn swing set out there, knocked myself colder than you. Uh, there was no way I was going to go to that Lightfoot's office. So he was, he was, after that we got Leo Musburger. I believe Leo was, Mike, you probably remember Leo, Ed, Shirley. You remember, he was a little bit vain. I always got a kick out of that toupee. <laughs> My hair's all gone south, but I just can't imagine wrestling that thing around. Sometimes you see him in a picture, he's got that oh, beautiful head of hair, and other time he's just, there's a reflection coming off there. <laughs> but he was a great guy too. He was a good principal, I thought. After that, I left water, so I don't know who was principal after that. Mr. Lightfoot, Mr. Musburger, was the uh, general I'll just comment. Um, our, remember the little Prince Albert tobacco cans? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know what you did out there in Bonner, but you had the best night callers in the world. And when we all went fishing, we had to stop at the ball field and in the front yards and pick night crawlers on the way up. The river. Yes. Fill, fill that Prince Albert can with oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> night crawlers. Yeah, I think Mike White had turned that into quite, quite an enterprise. He'd done all right with those things. He had a new battle with old Herkimer out there, old Nielsen. But uh, uh, Nielsen, he thought he owned the damn place. And Mike.
wife says, well, we'll see about this. <laughs> round and round and round. They went. <laughs> I was with my sons out one night picking worms here, and young Carter came out and put the run on us. <laughs> <laughs> he had a bad habit to do with that, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the 50 year old that I guess. <laughs> You mentioned earlier my father's name. He drove a truck for uh, Gus Stokely for 17 years and then went into as an outside millwright, became foreman of, or became the, the uh, president of the union here for many years and everything, so he's been around a while. You know, I kind of want to build on the Hoover Trail story a little bit. Uh, as kids, I believe Ed was you with us that day. We had David Henderson up there. Bill, you might have been along. Howie Johnson and Irene Nagel were right on the verge of getting married, and Collie up here was having kind of a party. Collie had lots of parties. <laughs> they didn't need much of He just celebrated. But anyway, they were out there in the back, and of course, Howie and uh, Irene were rather romantically involved. Uh, the rest of the people were drinking their Highlanders and doing their thing, and, and Howie and Irene were embracing rather feverishly, we come down Hoover Trail on our bicycles, lickety split, and we get to the last draw down here where you turn to go across the highway, David Henderson's chain come off. <laughs> well, halfway down to the, between the, the Hoover Trail and Collie's place. And when he hit the highway, I mean, he was airborne from that highway, out over that rock wall, crashed down beside Howie and I read. They never missed a beat. <laughs> That's probably my favorite Hoover Trail story. <laughs> so, you remember that, Bill? <laughs> seem to be taking up a lot of time here, but I remember when I was in the seventh grade, Mildred Dufresne was our teacher. Mr. Tony Petroff was the section foreman over here for the Milwaukee, between the two, Milwaukee Road and the NP Road here. We had a bell on the school, and the rope went all the way to the basement to where the shop was, and it was used for, de uh, for uh, recess and in case, uh, you know, fire drills and that type of thing. I watched her, she saw Tony coming one day, he was just a little short guy, the weeds were almost higher than he was. She knew something was wrong and started ringing that bell. Got all the kids out of there, the, the building was on fire. And at that, in those days, they didn't have any fire equipment, but they, the company sent out every available man they had. And how they got up on that roof, I'll never know, but they put that fire out and saved the school. I don't know if some of you might remember that. I don't know, Joe. I can remember not the fire itself, but some of the fire equipment. Because Frank Metz and I used to, we used to do the fire training down here at the plant, towards the end of the Champion era and into Stimson. And the fire apparatus they had for combating, combating the fire outside of the plant was these round buckets that come to a point. And there were barrels all along the, uh, I believe every other fence post. And they had these round conical buckets. The reason for those buckets was so the people wouldn't steal them. Because what can you do with a bucket like that? <laughs> but to fight a fire the size of the old schoolhouse with that type of equipment, plus the hose carts that they had, you know, it was primitive at best. And to save the building was that had to be quite a feat. I don't know how they could have pulled it off, but they did. Cedar shingles too. I 
talked to, uh, let's see, uh, Nina Seaman. She remembers that. It was her dad, she said. And uh, as she describes the story, you could almost feel the heat of the fire as they were come combating that. It was, it was it was a nice story. I enjoyed it. every time I hear that. I just I can't imagine how those folks could function under those conditions and, and be as successful as what they were. Frank, I uh, believe that uh, fire or that uh, hose cart is down here at the rural fire department too. Yeah, I'd sure like to collect one of them and have it out here. Yeah, I guess that's close enough. Yeah, I. I think if uh, you might might contact some of the guys down here at the fire station, but I believe that hose cart is down there. Some of the f other fire equipment that we had down here, the old stuff, is down there.
Okay, anybody else got anything? Looks like this is going to be a wrap then. Okay, there's refreshments out in the, uh, in the foyer out there. More conversation, more